Thanks for giving us a chance to be live again, wear shoes. It's just an amazing experience, isn't it? It's great. So thank you so much. It is an honor to be here representing our Center for Digital Agriculture at Illinois. And I'm just so pleased to welcome uh, Matt Hancher from, from Google. So let me do an introduction of him and then we will get started. Matt Hancher is an engineering lead at Google overseeing Google Earth, Earth Engine, and other projects at the intersection of geospatial data and sustainability. He co-founded the Earth Engine team in 2009 to bring Google's computing power to bear on global challenges in earth science and related fields. In addition to managing these teams, he works in application areas ranging from deforestation monitoring to global public health. Matt spent his early years as a researcher at MIT Media Lab, and prior to joining Google, he spent five years at the NASA Ames Research Center where he designed robots and wrote software to process moon and Mars satellite imagery to prepare for future exploration missions. I assume that Matt is with us, and he is. Matt, good to see you. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can, thank you so much for taking Excellent. the time to be here. I'm gonna start just by opening it up to you to talk about what you and your team are doing at Google these days. Sure, uh, yeah, thank you so much. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person, uh, but I'm uh, very happy to be able to join you all virtually. Uh, I'm originally from uh, Minneapolis. I grew up around the ag campus there and my uh, wife went to school at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, so I feel right at home even though I'm not there with you today. Um, and, uh, you know, as uh, you mentioned, my deeper background is in robotics, and it was super fun to hear uh, from the previous speaker about some of the amazing work going on at the intersection of robotics and ag. Uh, but as you've mentioned, for the last 15 years or so, I've been focused on the remote sensing and uh, earth imagery side of things. And uh, there are three different projects uh, within uh, my engineering team at Google, and maybe I'll introduce them briefly in chronological order, we really got started in this space through Google Earth about 15 years ago, really right before I came to Google uh, with the acquisition of the company Keyhole that had built the first prototype of what would become Google Earth. And uh, Google scaled that up and made it available to the world and uh, was working with people from the media to scientists and government users to take advantage of this new technology to be able to see changes in the landscape and tell stories about uh, our changing planet and, and make better decisions through satellite imagery. And it was through that work that we started hearing the consistent feedback that, hey, it was great that we could see all this imagery, but we really needed help uh, scaling the computational capability to make sense of this growing flood of data that was coming online from particularly uh, government funded uh, earth imaging uh, spacecraft, uh, huge quantities of data, uh, the scientific community knew what to do with the data, but not really how to scale it up because you know, earth scientists, even computational earth scientists tended not to be the same people as computer scientists who were adept at dealing with large scale data. And so that was what got us interested in at that intersection and led to the formation of the Earth Engine uh, cloud computing product uh, going back in, originally in its inception in 2009. Uh, we've been growing that. Uh, in the intervening decade, uh, first supporting a small number of researchers and then growing it up to supporting tens of thousands of researchers around the world in academic and uh, government settings especially, and then now uh, scaling that up uh, to uh, bring it to commercial market as well so that we can bring those scientific techniques out of the lab and put them into the hands of the explosion of amazing ag tech startups and other companies rising to the challenge of uh, this sort of moment in climate change. Uh, and we're speaking of climate change, the last uh, piece of my portfolio is uh, specifically focused on city level carbon footprints, helping cities understand the carbon footprint and take climate action by looking at the transportation network and uh, the energy uh, grid and so forth. Uh, so those are the three uh, projects in my arena. So Matt, what about the tools that you're working on, your team is working on, especially as it pertains to this event, Ag Tech Summit in Agriculture? Yeah. Absolutely. And this has been really exciting uh, to see because, it, in fact, we did not originally seek out to build tools for agriculture. We were building tools to, uh, to address a number of kind of adjacent problem areas uh, within the Earth Engine domain. So our cloud computing tools for remote sensing, our first focus there was in deforestation uh, and uh, building better tools for monitoring change uh, in the rainforests around the world. 
Uh, and we started kind of growing incrementally from there as people realized that those tools were also useful in adjacent areas. So we started bringing in more feeds of data and adding more computational capabilities to meet those needs. And then it just sort of has been growing uh, incrementally into more and more areas. And in recent years, we've been seeing a real uptick in usage specifically within agriculture, uh, ag tech companies uh, trying to make use of large scale remote sensing data for a whole range of applications. Uh, so uh, a lot of the early applications were focused on precision ag of one sort or another, how to make more precise decisions about how to apply additives, uh, manage water resources on the farm, uh, detect uh, crops, particularly when you were dealing with a large scale of farm and you can really take advantage of that unhealthy you know, space-based view to understand what's happening uh, in the fields. Uh, and then also because of our origins in deforestation, working with uh, the public sector and policy, uh, we've had a, a lot of great success applying similar techniques to the larger scale policy problems that come up around agriculture, questions like how you manage scarce water resources uh, on a very large scale. Uh, one example project that we've been really excited about is called the Open ET project. Uh, so ET is evapotranspiration, so uh, looking at the release of water uh, from farmlands up to the atmosphere and uh, we've been scaling that out all across uh, the Western states with a whole community of scientists who are using the platform as a way to explore a variety of techniques and intercompare and build ensemble models to really come to grips with this problem of how to manage our scarce water resources, first in the Western US, but then of course that's gonna be a global problem, particularly as climate change continues to take hold. You know, one of the hottest topics here right now, not only in agriculture, but everywhere is supply chain. We hear about it here today. Talk about these technologies as it pertains to supply chains. Yeah, uh, this has been a particularly exciting area for us in the last couple of years as we've started to work more and more with commercial companies. Uh, uh, because the lever that they're looking to pull is typically rooted in some supply chain somewhere. And we've been seeing a growing interest in the private sector, for example, in consumer packaged goods companies, in really understanding the environmental impact of their full supply chain. Uh, and you know, they're responding to consumer pressures, they're responding to regulatory pressures, they're responding to a rational self-interest as they see that we all have to kind of do our part in helping stop uh, the acceleration of climate change. And so uh, the tools in our toolkit have been particularly useful. Like the first great example was uh, in palm oil. So uh, in uh, the supply chain of a large manufacturer like Unilever has been one of our early partners in this space. Uh, they are very concerned when they source palm oil uh, that they're not sourcing it from uh, uh, plantations that are recently deforested or are helping drive deforestation in contexts like Indonesia. And so the ability to uh, monitor, first of all, areas uh, that are on that front of deforestation uh, and really understand where are they properly enforcing the front, where is illegal deforestation perhaps happening, and then tracing that back through the supply chain so that they can make competent buying decisions has been an early piece of the puzzle. Those core technologies are useful, of course, across a wide range of um, agricultural modes, not just palm oil. Uh, we've had uh, a great collaboration with uh, actually an Australian uh, company called NGIS who've been building a solution called Tracemark that takes some of those techniques powered by our Earth Engine platform and makes them available to a wider range of uh, ag supply chain uh, you know, stakeholders. Hey, Matt, I understand that there's a regenerative agriculture working group at Google. What is that all about? Yeah, uh, so this is, uh, it began as essentially my side gig at Google. Uh, I guess a little, little backstory here. Uh, uh, we have this portfolio of projects that are a little unusual in that our, our primary concern with them is putting in them in the hands of decision makers around the world to make better decisions about the environment. So this is, you know, a little different than the conventional corporate, uh, you know, model where you can measure, uh, you know, profit, for example, as your primary concern. And so we needed to develop a different framework for understanding how to prioritize where to invest our energies within this space. And so two years ago, we did a big analysis of all of the different uh, basically environmental drivers and looking for areas where we thought we had some unique opportunity to bring tools to bear, but we weren't yet investing. And uh, out of that analysis, 
regenerative agriculture just popped off the page as an area of tremendous potential, both from a carbon sequestration perspective, potentially the science is complicated there and helping advance the science is one of the things we're interested in doing, uh, but also the many co-benefits in terms of improved you know, uh, uh, water infiltration or uh, reduction in fertilizer use and so forth. And so we formed this group within Google and it's just started out as an interest group really where we began, because we're software engineers, first and foremost, we're not experts in any of those topics. So we had to begin by just educating ourselves for a while, uh, g giving ourselves a kind of uh, impromptu seminar in the topic until we felt that we could at least start talking to an actual expert and not immediately embarrass ourselves. Uh, and then once we got to that point, we began engaging with uh, actual experts to help us uh, understand where a company like Google could help. And now we're playing uh, a role supporting the growing number of ag-related projects around Google. Uh, so you'll have heard of some of these, uh, our, our mineral team that came out of Google X, uh, also using robots in an ag context uh, combined with remote sensing, uh, looking to help optimize food production at a global scale. Uh, but we're also running, for example, our research project in India, uh, where we're really trying to understand there uh, how to help them manage the very scarce water resources and regenerative techniques, shifts in land management are one part of that to make sure that they're making optimal use of, uh, of every drop of water that they have in some of those uh, water limited environments. So we're really, um, we're in a learning phase right now and that's part of why I'm excited to come talk to groups like this one because we're trying to understand uh, how a technology company like Google can actually be most useful to you all uh, in helping you solve your uh, your tech-driven problems in this space. We love hearing that, of course, and you know, you're not covering much ground here, but as a, as a kind of final question before questions, talk about more broadly, te you're, at, you're at Google, technology trends, what should we be paying attention to, generally speaking, and then, and then if you want to dig a little deeper on any of that, we've, we're in pretty good time, uh, time, time-wise. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I think there are a few trends that dominate everything that we do. Uh, you know, I alluded to one of them that started us off on this journey 10, 12 years ago that is still absolutely uh, playing out today, which is the continuing explosion of raw remote sensing data of various kinds. Uh, and uh, you know, for us, that began with the USGS decision to make the Landsat data uh, available without uh, an individual per scene cost that made it cost prohibitive for anyone to do a uh, really large scale analysis back in the day. Uh, and so suddenly the community had access to uh, an unprecedented archive and the question of, all right, how do we actually make use of that computationally was a real limiting factor. Today, the modern versions of that are things like companies like Planet uh, making higher resolution and daily imagery uh, you know, they recently made uh, eight band multispectral data uh, at that three meter resolution uh, available. We're just learning, I mean, it's the absolute beginning as an industry of understanding how to make use of a data set with that much uh, spectral and temporal and spatial depth. Uh, and it's just the beginning. There are more and more companies looking at using small spacecraft, especially as a way to cheaply put lots of instruments in space. And then drones are, of course, uh, changing the game uh, for the ability to collect data in situ at even higher resolution. So, uh, you know, expect that to continue, that trend. The flip side of that coin and the other technology that drives everything we do at Google these days uh, is machine learning as a, a way to get on top of that problem of data. Uh, this is an area that we had originally had to help advance from within Google uh, to solve a slightly different set of problems related to just how we map the world. So you know, my part of Google sits within the same uh, arena as Google Maps. And in order to make Google Maps, uh, we had to take huge amounts of imagery and make sense of it. Satellite and aerial imagery, street view imagery, and in order to turn that into maps uh, that we can keep fresh around the world, we've had to push on machine learning. Uh, so that was part of what powered the early uh, revolutions in deep learning for understanding images. Those techniques are similar to what we need 
in an agricultural or remote sensing space, but they're all actually somewhat different. You know, the, the satellite images that you get of a farm from a, a government sensor like, a, you know, Landsat or Sentinel-2, those are not the same thing as camera point images. And the techniques that you need to understand them are a little different. And again, we're just at the beginning of understanding what are the right uh, structures for a neural network to make sense of that data? Uh, how do we take those best practices and make them available to large audiences so that not everyone has to become a neural network expert themselves? Because that's not going to happen, obviously. Um, so uh, I think both of those trends, the explosion of data and the refinement and explosion of machine learning tools or artificial intelligence tools to make sense of that data, those are going to continue and it's going to make things really interesting over the next five or ten years in this space. Oh, I wish we had time to talk about, you said a couple of times, only the beginning, right? We're only in the beginning and it couldn't be more true what that looks like. You would be a great person to ideate around that. But we're going to open up for questions in the interest of time right now and maybe we can fill in some of those blanks as well. So, um, questions in the audience and Matt, bear with us when we have one. Uh, you'll hear it over over the um, AV. Sounds great. Not a problem. So Matt, oh, do you have one? Yes, I do. I, yes, I have a question that came in online. That I wanted go. to um, make sure we ask Matt. This comes from Ellingson Companies. Uh, and it's kind of twofold. So the first part of it is, how do you keep the shareholders or investors excited while you're developing um, an ag tech product and also learning from the customers. And the second part of that is um, understanding that it might take a long time to find the product market fit. How do you keep the funds flowing for that product development? Yeah, uh, great questions. Um, and I, I mean, I, I also imagine that there's potentially two lenses we could take to that. I'm not sure whether you were asking specifically how do we think about those problems at Google versus how do we see our customers, uh, you know, who are typically startups thinking about those problems. And the answers are probably different. Uh, I mean, at Google, we have the advantage of, uh, you know, tremendous existing resources that we can use to take a long view. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's something that the founders of Google uh, wrote right into the, the charter of the company from the beginning that, you know, we were going to do that. Uh, and our investors uh, have known that that's a part of our strategy since the beginning. Uh, and uh, so that has helped us create the space for projects like Earth Engine beginning in its early days as a research pro project. It actually started out originally within the organization that we call google.org, uh, which is our philanthropic organization. It's not literally a separate entity, but it's a, a space within Google for doing explicitly philanthropic work. And then as it became clear that uh, this was really multi-use technology, we kind of folded it into the core uh, of our geospatial uh, arm of the company and have been growing it from there. But even then we had the, the freedom, thanks to Google's uh, resources and support to take it slow. Uh, to focus on developing the underlying techniques with, uh, you know, research partners uh, and so forth, and uh, really understand uh, what the world needed before we thought about how to move it into a commercial market. And so we were in the sort of unusual position of really the commercial users coming to us saying, will you please let us buy it, rather than us having to go to them saying, you know, will you please buy this from us. Uh, Within the ag tech startup world in particular, uh, I mean, actually, the thing that I've seen most recently is just tremendous interest and appetite in that space writ large. I think getting investors interested in ag tech in the first place, uh, you know, it's probably a lot easier than getting investors interested in uh, a lot of other areas uh, of technology these days. And the trends that we see related to the climate, which I mentioned several times, are just going to push things in that direction. I think, you know, you can articulate the, the long-term reason why this is gonna be an ever more important growth area, you know, food, feeding a growing population in the face of increasing challenges uh, you know, on the ground due to climate change, uh, and ideally doing so in a way that can reduce the impact of ag on the climate or even use ag as a climate solution, those are all growth areas. And uh, 
you know, I think that, that story is thankfully not too hard to tell. It fits so much of our audience here in, in all sorts of pieces, Matt. Excellent. Other questions? We have time for one, maybe two more, but maybe just one. Are your uh, anal analytics um, only land-based, or are you also monitoring water, um, water uh, bodies? And if so, what kind of monitoring can you do um, from, uh, from water-based systems? bodies yeah uh, so uh, I think this is a, a great example of the kind of uh, gradual growth of our platforms into adjacent areas that we've seen we very much started focusing on uh, land uh, land use uh, originally um, and land cover and then have slowly grown to touch on some areas of water but I think we actually have a lot uh, of more uh, room to, uh, to grow there so uh, some of our early work has been focused on things like just mapping surface water extent and the change in surface water extent over time to help with protecting uh, surface water in areas where it's at risk. That you can view as a kind of land use or land cover change, actually. It's the loss of water as the primary uh, land cover type. Uh, from there, uh, our users started looking at things like uh, understanding water quality from space uh, in surface water contexts in particular, which of course is related to questions of uh, runoff from agriculture in many parts of the world. Uh, and then more recently, we've just started working with more people who are using our tools to uh, understand ocean uh, water and its relationship to the larger climate system, because of course, two thirds of the surface of the earth is water and you can't really understand what's going on with the climate without deeply understanding water. Uh, the area where our particular tools are strongest is anything that's sort of at the surface, uh, or uh, another way to put it more uh, from a, a more of a sort of data structures perspective is we're a two and a half D system. If your stuff is spread out in space uh, in, in, in you know, a lot of longitude and latitude, then that's fantastic. If you need a true full 3D modeling environment, that's not what our tool is about. And so deep water work, uh, we don't see as much of as a result, but uh, yeah, water as a, uh, a component of surface systems, absolutely. We have time for one more quick question if anyone has one. All right, seeing none. Matt, you just made a great day even greater. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Look forward to the next time with you. Uh, very happy to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, everyone have a, a great summit. Thank you again.